this, so we are the superior energy and the material energy is an inferior energy. Why is that? Because it does not have any consciousness. Material energy is just, um, um, you know, like matter, right? Which is, which is not, which does not have consciousness. And so we are constantly struggling. We are trying to exploit the resources of this material nature. And so we looked, we watched a video yesterday about how, you know, man is constantly trying to harness, hmm. right? Our, 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 find ways to uh, transform and utilize and exploit this material resource. So we'll continue uh, from that point on. So from text seven on, we're going to continue today. So, so far Krishna described how he is the source of both the spiritual and the material. Then the question may arise that if he's the source of everything, then why don't we see him everywhere? And Krishna answers that here. This is a famous verse. Uh, Mattaha parataram nanyat kinchidasti dhananjaya mai sarvam idam protam sutre, sutre mani gana iva. O conqueror of wealth, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. We'll discuss this a little more. And then he continues to uh, show us how we can see him in, in different aspects of nature. O son of Kunti, I am the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound in ether and ability in man. Punyo Gandha Pitivibhyamcha Tejas Chasmi Vibhavaso Jivanam Sarva Bhuteshu Tapas chasmi, tapas visu. I am the original fragrance of the earth and I am the heat in fire. I am the life of all that lives and I am the penance of all ascetics. Bijam maam sarva bhuta naam vidhi partha sanatanam buddhir buddhi matamasmi tejas tejas vinamaham. O son of Pritha, know that I am the original seed of all existence, the intelligence of the intelligent and the prowess of all powerful men. Balam balvatam chaham kamaraga vivarjitam dharma aviruddha bhuteshu kamo svibhartar shabha. I am the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire. I am sex life, which is not contrary to religious principles. O Lord of the Bharatas, Arjuna. Ye chaiva sattvika bhava raja sastama sashaye matte veti tan vidhi natamaham te shute mai. Know that all states of being, be they goodness, passion or ignorance are manifested by my energy. I am in one sense everything, but I am independent. I am not under the control. I'm sorry. I am not under the modes of material nature for they, on the contrary, are within me. The reason Krishna is saying this is sometimes people think that uh, Krishna is also like a human being and he comes under the control of the forces of nature. So he's clarifying that he's a controller of nature, not the being controlled by it. Deluded by the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance, the whole world does not know me, who am above the modes and inexhaustible. So same point. And actually in the, in the later uh, sessions, we are going to go into much more detail about these three modes. Mm. It's a very big topic. So mm. we'll cover that. They, this divine energy of mind consisting of the three modes of material nature is difficult to overcome, but those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. So after describing all the different ways in which Krishna is present in this uh, material world, right, then he, he ends by saying that, uh, well, this divine energy, even though it's divine hmm. and you can actually see me in this energy, uh, it's very difficult to overcome. So we'll talk about this. This is a very important verse, actually. So maybe we can get into our presentation now. And uh, right. So. so yesterday we talked about, uh, if you remember, there were some questions from Juma and uh, Delia about material world, right? And how to really connect with the material world. Mm -hmm. And here Krishna is now describing how we can actually see him uh, while living here. Can everyone see? No, not yet. 
Yes. Okay. So this section starts with how Krishna says that how he's in everything, but it's uh, not easy to see him. He's like the hidden signature. Um, I just wanted to look at this. I'm relatively new to chanting, though I've been practicing Nam Smarana for some time. I forgot which one. And then all of a sudden, the character George says, Hare Krishna. There are ways he reminds us to continue up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I know exactly which uh, episode you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Nice. So um, this is actually a very interesting uh, section because Krishna is sort of hidden mm -hmm. in, this, um, in this world, right? And, and, and many times, um, you know, we see that how the scientists are constantly on the lookout for this <clears throat> Right, so Krishna is talking about how he's the thread, and this has been the the, the big quest, right, mm -hmm. within science. They're trying to find the theory of everything, uh, that the thread that basically binds all the different theories together, all the forces of nature together. Einstein died looking for this uh, the thread that unifies everything, the unified field theory. Well, you need the volume. Is this is a very famous uh, physicist, Michel Kaku. Hello, I'm Professor Michio Kaku. I'm a professor of theoretical physics, and welcome to Cafe Classroom. Today, I'm going to start off by talking about how I got interested in physics as a child. Now you may say to yourself, most little kids want to become astronauts, firemen, or what have you. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to become a theoretical physicist. And the question is, how? How did I get started? Well, it all started when I was eight years old. When I was eight, something happened which changed my whole life. Changed my whole attitude toward everything. My teacher announced one day, that a great scientist had just died. Everyone was talking about it. And I'll still remember the newspaper that evening. They published a picture of his desk. And the caption said, this is the unfinished manuscript from the greatest scientist of our time. That picture changed my life. Because I said to myself, what could be so hard that the greatest scientists of our time couldn't finish it? What's so hard? I mean, it's a homework problem, right? Why couldn't he ask his mother? So I went to the library and I found out that this great scientist had a name. His name was Albert Einstein. And that book, that book that was on his desk the day he died, containing his unfinished manuscript was called the unified field theory, the theory of everything. He wanted an equation, no more than one inch long perhaps, that would allow him to quote, read the mind of God. So I said to myself, I wanna be part of this great journey. I wanna be part of this great quest to finish that theory, the theory of everything. So I decided to read everything I could about physics. Yeah. So as we can see this uh, theory of everything, things that tie together uh, is a formidable task. Uh, they have been able to kind of find an equation that unites electromagnetic force with a nuclear force but the gravity is, is always eludes them, the scientists. They're not able to find the origin of gravity and, and how to unite with other forces. So kind of quest of mankind to find the unifying theory. And then Krishna comes and says, don't waste much time. I can give you that unifying theory. <laughs> so Krishna says in this uh, verse, 7.7, uh, Mata Paratharan Nanya, Kinchit Asti Dhananjaya, Mai sarvam idam protam sutre mani gana iva. So he says, O conqueror of wealth, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. So what's the, uh, you, know, what, you know, what does that mean? Pearls being strung on the thread. Mm. 
So, you know, the beauty of a necklace is when the pearls are so closely tied, right, that you cannot really see the thread. Mm. All you see are the beautiful pearls that are strung together, right? And a, and a broken necklace, you can actually see the thread or a necklace which has been very loosely, uh, you know, um, all the pearls are together. That's not a very beautiful necklace. Yeah, so this, people probably would pay half the price if they found, find a necklace. Which, have, which you can see the thread. So this is Krishna's genius that he has strung everything so beautifully together that he remains the mysterious thread, the secret invisible thread. Hmm. And yet without the thread, none of this would actually have a resting place. All the pearls will just disperse uh, and, and be lost. And then Krishna is, is, is the force, the thread that keeps everything together. So somebody could say, well, you know, what is that force that's keeping everything, the sun in its orbit, right, mm. the moon in its orbit, you know, just this, you know, like we were discussing earlier that, you know, they're trying to figure out what is this gravitation, right, mm. not able to find that. So what's keeping everything, everything, together. everything together, and Krishna is describing here that it is actually him uh, that everything is resting on. So maybe we can hear from you mm. how you see um, Krishna as the thread mm. or what what do you, how do you see Krishna as a thread? And what does it mean for Krishna to be the thread? Mm. Maybe people can type? Yeah, maybe people can type. What holds everything together? Yeah. There has been, Naji saying, there's been some progress in this direction. Um, it always feels like, right, that we're almost there. Mm. <laughs> and then somebody comes along and says, well, not quite. This pearl is... It's <laughs> not if the equation that I heard about um, would actually count as unified field theory. I think it's, um, it's not fully filled in yet, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, kind of the framework for unified field theory. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what it is. It's, uh, um, it's, uh, um, anyway, I won't, I, I, I would have to look in my notes to see it, but, uh, my, my, my physics press professor divulged it to me. Um, and I was very excited by it. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, there is a lot of work and, you know, we, we get close to it. Right. But then, you know, going past the point seems uh, with using our own mind and intelligence, right. Yeah. seems almost, uh, Chaitanya is saying that um, like you don't see him just like the thread in the necklace. Yeah. yeah. As a soul, he's inside us. Yeah. He's inside and, you know, everywhere. And so it's, uh, he keeps himself hidden. Actually, this was an interesting um, one time, you know, Richard Dawkins, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. Mm. And so there was this interviewer who asked him, he said, uh, so dear sir, you know, you've written this whole book. Uh, you know, that how this whole idea of God is a delusion. And based on that, you have earned, you know, like your book has become such a bestseller and you've earned like, I don't know, thousands mm -hmm. and thousands, millions of whatever, how many, you know, you've gotten so rich over this book. What if one day you actually met God? Mm. What would you say to him? So then Richard Dawkins response to that interviewer was, I would say to him, my dear sir, why have you kept yourself hidden for so long? <laughs> <laughs> so... So. And the other, other way I can think of how Krishna, uh, he's happy being the thread because thre nobody pays, like people won't even pay a cent for the thread, right? Mm, mm. People want the pearl. Yeah. He could have made himself the pearl, mm. but he is so humble that he says, I'm happy just being the, the thread. Yeah. Kind of like the salt also, right? Mm. I was, you know, today when I made my sabzi, you know, I forgot to put salt mm. and I was just appreciating that, you know, you can add all the spices, but without the salt, it's just not complete. Mm. And so Krishna is like that, you know, he's the one. And we talk about that. How is the taste of everything? Right? Yeah, we wear this uh, neck beads and it's very interesting that uh, you can put different kinds of thread here. And when we go to uh, Vindavan, if you put just a regular thread, it, it breaks in, in a month or two. Hmm. So... There is a special thread called, uh, it's like, it's called the parachute thread. They use it for the same stuff that to make parachutes. So it's very strong. So whenever we go to Vindavan, we ask the, the bead guy to, to uh, put our, this necklace in the parachute thread so it doesn't break. So yeah. Krishna is like the ultimate parachute thread. <laughs> <laughs> so let's continue. So, you know, and the interesting thing is that, you know, he doesn't want to hide because he wants to hide. Mm. He wants, you know, so he's hidden in plain sight, mm. which means that he's right there. Just like 
um, you know, there are um, many art pieces where, you know, the artist will actually put their signature in such a way that, um, you know, it's very hard for people to know. Like, for example, this very famous art, art, art piece, the Mona Lisa. Um, Does anybody know where uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci put his signature? The clue is mm. hidden in plain sight. Yeah, hidden in plain sight. Let's watch this. Uh, so it's a long one. We won't watch the whole thing. Yeah. Is it? Okay. So if you go back, go in and you see the eye. It's right. Did you guys get to see? Hidden in plain sight. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see that it's uh, his uh, in the I. You can see the initials L V. Yeah, Van Gogh. This is Van Gogh. Yeah, but yeah. the previous one. Yeah, this one. Nature. I never knew that there was. The... Yeah. So. So here you can see how. Yeah. The left left eye. Yeah. It says right eye here. Okay. Mona Lisa was not painted by Van Gogh, it's by Leonardo da Vinci, right? Leonardo da Vinci. That is the, this one is the next one. This is just oh, the next one. Oh, okay. Very small segment of this video clip. Yeah. Like that, there are many, you know, others. And then there is actually, they use this ultraviolet. Um, this is another thing. I don't know, maybe we don't need to watch it, but um, they're using. Yeah, the, the signatures are so hidden that they, um, they use the ultraviolet or the infrared. infrared. Camera to, to find out who, who the painter was. This quick video shows you one of the ways we look for hidden signatures on paintings. Hi, my name is Scott Haskins. I'm a painting conservator. This painting was sold in 1899 by Christie's Auction House as a tribute to Sir Joshua Reynolds, one of the most famous English artists of the time. The owner today wants to look at it with infrared light. We do this through a camera called an infrared reflectometer. This allows us to look in areas that have been repainted or where the varnish has gone so dark you can no longer see details. This painting has darkened substantially in the dark areas. And in fact, um, there is no signature or any inscriptions visible. But with the infrared, you can see that in the lower left corner, where it's very dark, and there are no details visible, with the infrared reflectometer, you can see that a signature is very visible. As you can see, so that's the thing, signature. So. Krishna's material energy, if you remember yesterday, uh, we discussed how the separated, we use the word separated energy. So one of the qualities of the separated energy is that the, the, the separated energy creates a curtain through which we are not actually able to see, you know. You, the need, uh, you need special like infrared vision, you need special vision, Krishna says. That the vision of love through that you can actually see Krishna. Charito bhakti right? yeah. That you need eyes which are anointed, anointed with love to be able to see. Uh, this special signature. But Krishna, he understands our, our struggles and he also knows that this world is all that we have access to. Mm. So he comes, you know, in this section of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks about, you know, where we can see him. And, and everyday common things that we use every single day and on which our life depends. He mm. says, you can actually see me in all those little things. And actually for me, you know, like one of the things is that, you know, I'm extremely sensitive to water. So mm. when I first read this section where Krishna says, and the taste of water. I was so happy because, you know, some people like there are, the, I, and while doing this research, we came across that there are actually people in the world uh, who have actually made a profession out of being a water taster. And Do you know the, the word for somebody who tastes something? Sommelier. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. I, How I did you know that, Jillian? Just reading around the internet and stuff. Yeah. So this guy, Martin, what's his name? Martin something. He, he's a water sommelier. Martin, yeah. It's quite interesting that um, the next one, 
this. People always think there is no value to water. And what motivates me is that I want to give water a value. You are a water sommelier. Correct. And you believe uh, that there are many types of water and flavors of water, and that it's important to know the distinction. I'm not even believing in that. I think there is actually. It's a. It's a fact. Ooh, uh, here we go. <laughs> it's water. Great. <laughs> I love water. it. I love it. When I started this whole water concept in 2012, here in Los Angeles, where everybody said only in LA. There is a water sommelier. And then I said to the people there, only in LA, people think water has no value, but they're living in the desert. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, look at action, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we actually have a spring close by and uh, we go to collect our water from that local spring. And it's amazing, you know, uh, even according to Ayurveda, water actually has, you know, uh, when we just filter the water, then it loses its prana. Mm. But when we go to that spring and we collect our water, that water is just bursting with prana. And that's such a, you know, crisp, really tasty water. And so and there is, a, that's what Krishna is saying, that he is the taste of that water. Mm. And uh, not and, just... Yeah, not just water. When he says, Raso aham apsu kante, uh, he means that he's a taste of anything, actually. Whatever we... Uh, the quality of taste actually comes from uh, the sense of uh, taste, mm. which requires something liquidy to be there. Actually, uh, you cannot taste anything without the saliva. Without the saliva. And right. so that is, you know, when so everything that we taste is because of the presence of this water. Yeah, and, and any kind of uh, fruits, vegetables, or whatever, everything has water in it. A liquid, a taste of any liquid for that matter, wine or whatever people juice. Right, so that's rasa. That's rasa. And this water, uh, actually scientists, they've been studying and they find out now that, you know, for the longest time, there was this discussion, does water really even have a taste? Mm. Uh, but now they're figuring out that actually water, you know, the, the, our tongue actually has a separate uh, sense or a, sense. Uh, like a sensor to actually be able to taste the taste of water. Mm. And we have preferences and not just us, but actually other animals also. Yeah, animals, and, insects. Yeah. We we saw that how even they uh, actually have that. And you know, when we go and take get our water from this local spring, the local people there tell us that many times, like there are animals, they'll just come there when they are sick. They'll just come to that spring mm. to to drink that water because you know they know by drinking that water they'll actually heal themselves. So there's a lot. I mean, this water is what makes up our body. Mm. And um, they said that the the wars of the future will not be over, will not be fought over oil, but over water. And it's the, it's the commodity that is getting scarce uh, day by day, year by year. And you can already see so many countries and states, they, they're starting to fight with each other over water. Yeah, and you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, resource, right? And yet, you know, if we are not careful, again, same mm -hmm. thing, if we don't treat this nature, this Krishna's amazing divine nature, uh, with uh, with love and with respect, then we you know we lose that opportunity. I was reading in um, one of the grocery bags that we um, we shop, moms uh, they have a um, fact there. It says that uh, in America we spent or, or use some sixteen trillion gallons of water just for lawn mowing mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. Just imagine the amount of water that is uh, used just for lawn mowing. Yeah. And the world is running out of drinkable water. The only 2% two, 2 of the world's water is drinkable. Mm. <clears throat> and Prabhupada talks about that, that, you know, ultimately when we need to drink water, we need Krishna's help. Because mm. even though there are vast oceans with so much water, mm. but we cannot really drink that water. Mm. Only when Krishna takes that water out of the ocean mm. and the sun evaporates it, and then it comes down as rain, mm. right? That's how we can actually use that. Mm. 
So we see that, you know, these are things that we cannot take it for granted. And Prabhupada, and we'll read a, a lecture that Prabhupada gave, mm. where he talks about that, you know, even though we may not be able to see Krishna, but we can actually taste Krishna. Mm. Just by remembering every every time we drink water, we can appreciate, mm. oh, this really nice taste that I'm um, that uh, that I'm experiencing is actually his, you know, that is him. Mm. And uh, actually, the other thing is also that you know one can uh, drink all kinds of different liquids, but your thirst can actually only be quenched by water. Yeah, because you can drink soda, you can drink juice, but regard it, it actually increases our thirst even more. So that also is another point that only Krishna can actually quench our thirst, mm. right? And then Krishna says that he is actually the smell of the earth. Now, this is so amazing because, you know, like coming from India, especially in a hot summer when the first monsoon rains come, mm. then the earth actually gives out this really, like really beautiful, exhilarating smell. And we, you know, we had no idea that actually there is a scientific name for that smell. Does anybody know what it's called? <laughs> Quiz time. Uh -huh. What is the smell of the earth? You know, when the first rains hit the earth. I think it's petrichor. I'm not able to pronounce it. Something like that. Oh, oh, there you go, petrichor. Yes. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting that um, there are there is uh, uh, there are companies that are now trying to bottle that smell in a fragrance as a fragrance. And so. Uh, Hello and welcome, you're listening to One India News and I'm Pooja Sachseva. Who doesn't love the smell of rains and that sweet smell of wet earth after rains are over? But alas, it is very short-lived and all we are left with is the polluted air and the smells of surrounding afterwards, isn't it? But finally, someone has put that smell in a bottle. Walk into a shop in the bustling Teen Darwaza area of the old Ahmedabad and all you have to do is just ask for Mitti Itru to give you that high even in the hottest of summers. It is also called Itre Khaki. One of the oldest Itar sellers, Vivek Diliwala, is opposite Juma Masjid who sells this perfume. The price ranges from Rs. 120 to 6. So, you know, it's actually an Itar, which is a very traditional uh, way of making uh, perfume. And they they have just natural means to natural extract means, the... Yeah, they have these huge big pots. We actually saw a documentary on mm -hmm. that, right? They have these huge pots and they, so they bring out, they, they trap that smell. And so they boil the things into vapor. They, the vapor is condensed and then... It's, yeah, so it's called mitti. Mitti means earth, literally. So mitti, the fragrance of earth. 600 pot. Petrico. Uh, we don't need to, huh? Do we need to watch this? It's also interesting. Uh, it says rainfall actually releases aerosols. Uh, somebody went through the trouble of finding out why this smell comes out. Oh, sorry about that. So these are the using high speed cameras. They observe that when a raindrop hits the porous surface, it traps tiny air bubbles at the point of contact. The bubbles then shoot up, creating a fizz of aerosols. You know, it goes on. I mean, there is actually a whole field of study hmm. where, you know, they're trying to figure out why we like this smell and, you know, how it affects us and so on and so forth. And Krishna's saying, well, you know, you like that smell. Hmm. You just see that smell because I am that smell, hmm. right? I am that smell of the, this earth. And um, it kind of shows our intimate relationship, right? With, um, I don't know, let's see, I forget. It. Oh, yeah, it's a similar kind of thing about. to the next one so krishna says i am the oh, oops. krishna says i am the the light of the sun and the moon and that's something that we uh, depend on so much throughout the day um, right right from the 
early morning to get up and then to carry out our day. Everything on earth is actually um, uh, run by sun. Sun is, is the engine for this whole planet and for this whole solar system. Uh, right from our food to our moods to our um, everything that we need for our life is, is produced by the sun. And actually also, you know, it is said like uh, when the sun, uh, when we don't get enough sun mm. or like you know, we're moving into autumn and then winter. So, you know, we're getting less and less sun. So our sense of happiness and our sense of well-being mm. is actually so deeply connected to that. So when we don't get sun, that it actually affects our mood. Mm. And of course, we know all about vitamin D and how, you know, so on and so forth. But even like, um, you know, uh, it's amazing. Like when we wake up in the morning, mm. we wake up because the sun is up. Mm. So we feel that there's a new beginning when, the, when we see the sun. And in the evening, when the sun goes down and everybody just goes like, okay, what's the point? Mm. What's the point of doing anything? Let's just go to sleep. <laughs> so we have such an intimate relationship with the sun, which is actually, um, this, yeah, which is Krishna. And Krishna says in the Bhagavatam that both by the setting of the sun and the rising of the sun, our lifespan is being shortened, right? Mm. Except for one who is engaging their time in, the, in glorifying the Supreme Lord. So let's look at a little bit about this amazing sun, how... It produces the energy that we all use only a fraction of. Being that uh, in the Vedic system, the sun actually has a very, very special place. Mm. And um, um, the sun is actually considered to be, sun and the moon, they're actually considered to be the eye and the moon of Krishna. Yeah, both two eyes. Two eyes, right? And uh, we see that um, all life that we see here on earth is actually because of the presence of sun. And so even when we chant the Gayatri Mantra, for example, mm. right, it is, you know, uh, extolling, mm. you know, the sun. And, and it's also described that Krishna is also known as the ultimate sun. Mm. So Prabhupada, in his Back to God in magazine would always, you know, he had this thing written that Maya is Andhakar mm. and sun is Krishna is the sun. Mm. And wherever there is Krishna, there, there cannot be the presence of Maya or Andhakar. And... Uh, So um, together 100. And the other Krishna says, I am the moon, and moon is described as having a tremendous impact on life uh, on this planet uh, because of so many reasons. Um, Krishna says later on in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, moon is regulates the life of all the planets, as all the plants and all the, all the trees and plants. He is considered the, the king. Yeah, and it's interesting because Krishna also appears in the moon dynasty. Mm. So uh, the moon is, of course, you know, uh, has, has, you know, has a lot of impact even on our, on our mood and our emotions. Mm. And then and again, you know, uh, just, a, you know, so this is actually a little, you know, where they're contemplating what would the earth be without a moon. Mm. So we take all of this so much for granted, right? We see the our sun. The moon is on the move. Each year it drifts an estimated 1.5 inches further away from Earth. And in the process, Earth's rotation is actually slowing down. What if one night the moon simply disappeared? Would we miss it? A full moon is on average 14,000 times brighter than the next brightest night sky object, Venus. So without it, every night would be as dark as a new moon, and stargazing would be spectacular. But by the next morning, you'd begin to realize just how important the moon is for life on Earth. To start, between the sun, Earth's rotation, and the moon, the moon has the largest influence on Earth's tides. Without it, high and low tides would shrink by an estimated 75%. This would jeopardize the lives of many types of crabs, mussels, and sea snails that live in tidal zones, and disrupt the diets of larger animals who rely on them for food, threatening entire coastal ecosystems in the process. Within a few decades, we would start to see mass population declines in the sea and on land. One of the largest spawning events in the world occurs in the Great Barrier Reef. Each November, in the days following the light of a full moon, coral colonies across the reef, spanning an area larger than the state of New Mexico, release millions of egg and sperm sacs within nearly minutes of one another. Scientists are certain that the full moon plays a role in the timing, but exactly how remains a mystery. So, you know, we can see that, you know, one of the 
um, greatest challenges that we face as a as a modern you know um, person is that we have we have sort of disconnected ourselves mm. right from the sun and the moon and and the stars and and we we don't quite understand how all of these things are having such a they have a direct effect mm. on our on our physical body on our mind and and eventually on our ability to actually appreciate and see the the divine hand i remember uh, you know many many years ago we had gone to utah and uh, we were driving through uh, uh, we we had to get to our uh, vacation rental and it was very very dark and i think it was a new moon night and uh, as we were driving we had never so we just stepped out of the car and it was pitch dark and we looked up in the sky mm. and you remember it was such a beautiful uh, you know this beautiful milky way that we could see and uh, you know living in the city we never get to see yeah you, you feel know. that you could just pluck it out it was so uh, like tangible yeah so you know we uh, we just you know we take all of this so much for granted but just to you know take a moment this entire section is a meditation of sort mm. you know where one is just taking a moment to pause and think about the sun and think about the moon and think about what would happen if we didn't have the moon or we didn't have the sun it's like our daily interaction with krishna in so many ways and as we are rushing through our day we meet so many people but we don't look at them and similarly we are rushing through our day and we meet krishna so many times in these things but we never look at him so uh, he's like right there in plain sight but we don't see him actually they say that the opposite of love is not hate mm. the opposite of hate love is indifference mm. so you know um just sort of this the section kind of just wakes us up and makes us not ignore the fact that you know every day the sun is coming at a certain time and and there even now you know there's a lot of discussion even in ayurveda and you know a lot of research about how the body has its own built in clock mm. right which is connected to um the sun and the moon right so let's see what yeah there is uh, oh yeah then we'd get into the seed and uh, yeah maybe let's pause here and see if you guys have any what's the time okay okay so, okay yeah this goes on so maybe um any any comments or questions or yeah wow. tapas prabhu read a research by that by 2030 half of the us and whole of india will be in drought yeah wow. water is definitely um shiva i don't think he would conceal himself from those who love him those who don't believe in him cannot perceive him so he conceals very nice mm. very nice and that's exactly the point that it is only through love that one can see him mm. so he's um you know um he's invisible to those that um they don't want to see why would he want to stay concealed from us is it not us that don't have eyes to see yeah yeah i mean there are several reasons why he's staying concealed because um we don't want to see him and uh he also wants to teach us that um uh by i mean by concealing himself he's achieving so many things allowing us to enjoy uh the enjoy the illusion uh just like the, the the teacher goes away from the classroom and the students think that they can do anything mm. so krishna is like that he's hiding and uh, so that we can try to exhaust our material desires and realize that we, we can't really enjoy <clears throat> yeah it, it's it's um you know it's really to facilitate our own desire mm -hmm. that uh you know we want to feel that um you know like i got this right i don't need i know i don't need you you know in this equation so krishna says all right but then he also knows that we cannot really do this on our own mm. so he says all right i'm just going to hide i i and i often think of like a kid you know like as a mother i know that you know when your son wants or your daughter wants to go to college and they say well you know got to go out of here you know if you had a way if you could be krishna you just want to like okay i'll just be invisible and i'll take care of everything for you <laughs> because who's going to take care who's going to you know do this and do that so krishna knows that we cannot really function in this world without him so he says hey i'll just come and since you don't really um you, you just want to you know experience your own freedom so i'll just stay invisible but i'll still take care of things for you and you know and also we want to learn our lessons like if if he if he was right in in our face mm. then whatever lessons we needed to learn probably you you learn them out of fear or out of whatever it is mm. but uh, we want to learn them mm. on our own 
Yeah. So that's another reason he stays conceived. And love means, right, that, uh, you know, when we finally start looking at everything and saying, where are you? Hmm. you know, I want to know you. Uh, that's when he starts to reveal himself. And he is in the Bhagavad Gita. He's like saying directly, he's like, okay, you can see me in this. Hmm. Um, just one second. We'll just quickly go through these and then we'll take uh, five questions. Imagine all this, the entire universe is just a speck for Krishna. Yeah, hmm. Krishna says that later that everything is a spark of my splendor why would you want to stay no, 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 no. okay krishna is a personal being no, no, no. the order of the universe that we just take for granted that things work the way they do without thinking about it. all right now somebody has a question yes Yes, go ahead, Rajesh. Let's do the gallery again. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. We say God is not visible, but uh, uh, by our senses, if something is very plenty, it is everywhere, then we don't recognize its existence. Just like space, hmm. space is one of the elements and one of the five elements. But we say it is empty space, it is nothing, but it is something. Hmm. Very nice. <laughs> because of space, everything is possible. Hmm. That is true. The world is just like that. Yeah. It is everywhere, but it is plentifully available, so much plentifully available that we don't recognize its existence. Hmm. Yes. Such a good point. We're actually going to be showing a video that's coming up in our next section about the scientist who has written a book called How Something Comes Out of Nothing. <laughs> and this is exactly what he says that because, you know, they just think that space There's means nothing. nothing you yeah. know, very nice. Thank you. Very, very nice. I feel Krishna is revealing himself all the time. We just got our eyes closed. The easiest place to see if in bad time. Once we learn to see him in bad times, he will reveal himself during good times as well. Yes. What a beautiful point, mm. Tapas Prabhu. Yes. He really does. I mean, he's waiting, you know, and he's saying, hey, here I am, you know, but then we're like so busy, you know, with other things that we say, all right, you know, I, I don't have time. And this is actually another thing. Krishna says that I am time and we don't have enough time. We don't have enough Krishna. <laughs> we don't have, you know, we're so busy, you know, just trying to get from point A to point B that we miss, we miss seeing the sun, we miss seeing the moon, we miss seeing Krishna. Mm. It's not that we don't see Krishna, it's that we don't recognize what we are seeing as him. Very nice. Yes. 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 And that's what, that's what Prabhupada says. I mean, maybe we can read a little bit from Prabhupada's, uh, you know, tomorrow. Okay. So yeah, it's exactly what Prabhupada says there that, you know, we, we just miss it. Mm. Anybody else? Today was when Srila uh, Prabhupada started, uh, left India for US. Oh, that's mm. nice. How fortunate, you know, but very nice. Juma, do you have any um, any thoughts uh, on Shilanchita, Bhavani, Shashi? Yeah, I have this, uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, confusion as so, like uh, he says in the sixth verse that uh, I am in everything. I'm in matter and I'm also in spirit. And um, last week you were saying that, you know, uh, from that Fox thing that where you are situated and how you are saturated and how you are satisfied and how you're placed basically is what, uh, uh, you know, your uh, interaction with the material world is all about. So if he is in everything, then how is he placing different beings into like, we feel, I feel that there are people who are very materialistic. Somebody uh, uh, compa in comparison would be very spiritual, spiritualistic. So if he is in everything, then why is it the difference of placing us differently? 
Um, so this is something that we're going to talk in great, great detail in one of our sessions called Modes of Material Nature. So Krishna, he says over and over again that he is very aloof and he's very neutral. So he's sitting in our heart and he's just facilitating our desires. So in every, in every body, we say, oh, you know, it would be so nice if we could just sleep for six months out of the year. Mm -hmm. So Krishna says, all right, let's go give that a try. So then we enter into a body of a polar bear or we say, oh, you know, actually, not sure. I don't want that. I want something else. So our being placed in different situations, whether we have spiritual inclinations or we are driven materially, and even when we are driven materially, there are three different modes in which we could be driven materially. So that's called Satogun, Rajogun, Tamogun, right? Goodness, passion, and ignorance. All that is completely our own choice that we make. So we desire, okay, you know, I, I want to, you know, go and do this. And once we associate with that mode, then that mode starts to take over us. So it is not Krishna who's putting us in all these different situations. He's simply um, facilitating our, our, our particular desires. Okay. Does that help, Juma? Sure, yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay.